so the first thing is, uh, I'm not going to stand up here and sell to you or talk about Upserve too much, but since the uh, program all says Swipely and I'm now telling you it's Upserve, we branded this morning, uh, rebranded this morning, so you're the first people to hear about that. Uh, about 80% of our customers are in the hospitality space, about 4,000 restaurant locations across the country, and they've been pulling us in this direction, and we wanted a brand to reflect that. So that's, uh, that's us now. You got the wine glass with the cross knife, front of the house, back of the house, forms a plus sign, data, that's us. <laughs> so this is gonna be the agenda introduction today, and I'm just gonna jump right into it since we started about 10 minutes late. So the first thing is, why should you even listen to me? Why should you care? Uh, I've been doing marketing for about 15 years, mainly for tech companies in Silicon Valley, um, but my wife uh, was a restaurant manager for 20 years now. Our, she says she's retired now, I'm trying to talk her out of that. Um, and uh, I've helped the restaurants that she's worked in, I've helped other local businesses, so it's not just marketing as applied to a tech company, uh, but marketing applied to actual local businesses. And the last five companies that I've worked at in the Valley have all targeted and helped uh, small businesses. Um, so hopefully I have something interest uh, to say, and if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, I'm a proud UCLA Bruin, um, thus my Twitter handle. Okay, so let's just jump in right into it. So the title of this is Effective uh, Restaurant Marketing or the things you need to know about effective restaurant marketing. Um, before I get into it, I just want to point out that you cannot overcome bad service. You cannot overcome bad hospitality. It does not matter how good your marketing is. Um, and so it's really important that you understand uh, that first and foremost, any marketing is essentially amplifying your reputation, your voice, uh, your standing in the community. So if you have a great standing in the community, if you have a great restaurant, if you have a great business, marketing will help you amplify that. It will also help you ampl amplify the opposite of that. If everything you do is not up to snuff in the restaurant, that will uh, uh, get broadcast as well. Um, so thou shall not provide bad hospitality. But it's way better than having 10 commandments. You only have to remember one, right? Okay. Before we get into the actual marketing, uh, it's, it's important to understand what you're actually trying to accomplish uh, with marketing. And people think of marketing as advertising, um, but that's actually just a component of it and it's something you can do. I think you'll find that I'm a proponent of a much more practical guide to marketing your business. Uh, things that require sweat, equity, effort, knowledge, but not necessarily huge budgets because it wouldn't be very, uh, useful uh, for you to come in here and have me tell you if you just run a Super Bowl ad your restaurant's going to be successful. Um, I haven't even got to run a, a, a Super Bowl ad. And by the way, that's my dream as a marketer. So if anyone's working at a company that will allow me to run a Super Bowl ad, let's talk afterwards. Um, so the first three things, or the only three things, the one is be discoverable. Um, and this is people have to be able to find you. And I'm going to go into that a little bit. Um, but there's some basic blocking and tackling. And uh, we get asked things like, is it really important that I'm on Facebook? Do I really need my own website? Um, the answers to those are yes, they are important and you do need your own website. We'll get into that in a minute. But at the end of the day, regardless of where your uh, customers are looking, um, you need to be found there. Um, there's some huge national websites, platforms, et cetera, that I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Um, but maybe there's something in your local market that's important to you. You have to understand where your customers are looking uh, and then you have to be there. Um, that's called being discoverable. The second thing is staying top of mind. Uh, I think everyone has fairly realistic expectations that your customers are not going to come into your restaurant seven nights a week. Uh, maybe a couple do. We had one guy named Corbell Dave when I was a bartender back in college. And you come in so much the alcohol is named after you, that's an indication you're a pretty big regular. Um, but uh, other than the Corbell Daves of the world, your goal is to, um, is to stay top of mind. So when they decide to go out, when they decide to spend their money, they're at least thinking about you. Not that they'll necessarily come into your, your establishment every single time, um, but they're more likely to come into your establishment. Uh, and then the final thing is, I'm sure everyone's heard the marketing maxim before, it's seven times easier to sell to someone you've already sold to than to sell to a new person. Um, the secret to 
great marketing, the secret to running a successful local business, not just restaurants, by the way, local sporting goods store, independent bookstore, is to get repeat business. And uh, if you're discoverable and people will come in and try, and then you have good processes and uh, good systems in place to turn those uh, guests into repeat guests, you are going to be a successful restaurant. <laughs> All right, so these are the 10 basic things, and I hate reading to people, so I'm not going to read them to you. The good news is, is I have a slide for each one of these things, so I'm going to dive in uh, to more detail on this. And by the way, I'm happy to share the slides or somehow make them available, um, so I will do that so you don't have to feverishly take notes on everything. First thing, you need to have a good website. You need to have a great website. Um, and one of the things that you absolutely have to do is understand what people are looking for and make that information available as easily and painlessly as possible. Uh, I'm sure you've all had the experience of, uh, as a consumer where, I don't know, it's day after Christmas and you need to buy a cable for your kid's video game system and you find a store and you, you can't even figure out if they're open or not. Restaurants aren't always open seven days a week. Um, so if you're closed, please let people know. I went to one the other day just to find out it was closed on Monday. Um, and that was actually TripAdvisor's fault, not their own fault. But the point is, it's a frustrating experience. Um, so make sure that the information people need is front and center. It's really six things. If you, if people can, if, uh, if you can ask these six questions, when are they open? Where are you located? The rest of them there. And as a user, you can go to your own website and say, this will be very easy for someone to find without them having to you know, click through three times, four times to find the specific page. If you have all this front and center, um, uh, you'll be successful. Uh, the next thing is, is pictures, pictures, pictures. Food, ambiance, staff, you literally cannot have too many pictures. Um, it's just really important. A lot of, you'll, the reason I mention this specifically is you will see some places and they have a coat of arms and like illustrations and it looks fancy and nice or whatever, but at the end of the day, it does not convey what it's like to eat in your establishment. Um, you want, uh, uh, I think we have a guide on upserve.com on like tips on photography, but like you want uh, <clears throat> warm natural lighting. You want uh, pictures of your food. Uh, you want, um, if you have good views at your restaurant, if there's something special about your restaurant, if you have a great patio or a fireplace or something, you want pictures that uh, make people want to come in. There's lots of more things that go into making a great restaurant. I by no means want to position this as all you need to know. Um, but if you get these two basics right, critical information and lots of uh, photography, you're 90% of the way there towards a great website. Claim your profiles. Um, show of hands, everyone that's just a huge, rabid fan of Yelp just can't wait to get more Yelp reviews. No? no? Yeah, I got a couple of people? All right. Um, some of these things are necessary evils. They've built a market. They've built viewership. They've conditioned consumers to look there. Um, you have to participate. You have to join in. Uh, it's not enough to just hope that uh, it's going to take care of itself on its own or that uh, you're going to ignore it and things are still going to be fine. Certainly that happens from time to time, but you're taking a much bigger risk uh, than you need to. What a lot of people don't realize is, uh, is that you can claim your profile. You can say, this is my business, prove you're the owner, um, and you get a lot of benefits from that regardless of how you feel about um, the site itself. Uh, the first thing is you get to ensure all the information is correct. Uh, had the restaurant I went to on TripAdvisor, had that owner claimed their profile and updated their open information, I wouldn't have shown up there on a Monday night and then wondered what I was going to do when I was hungry and standing in the cold. And by the way, uh, Californian in the Midwest in February, like I was prepared for a blizzard and um, thankfully it wasn't that cold. but. Uh, uh, you don't want people out in the elements confused about what's going on. The second thing is you get to control the message. A lot of these sites, all they do um, is they're purchasing business information from third-party data sites. Uh, and who knows what information is in there. Uh, a description of your restaurant, instead of 
uh, saying, you know, it might just say Italian restaurant, whereas if you, could, uh, if you have access to the profile and preview of the business owner, you can say an authentic Tuscan restaurant influenced by blah, 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 blah. Um, you get to put a full description. You get to make it sound enticing. Uh, and in general, you'll, you'll have a more inviting, welcoming profile. You get to upload uh, pictures. Again, your photography, in my opinion, uh, is gonna be really important. And then the final thing, some of the sites notify you when things happen. So you can set thresholds about whether if you get a good review, bad review, let me know. If you're not already using a reputation monitoring solution uh, so that you're aware of, um, of new th reviews as they come in, um, the sites themselves sometimes are willing to tell you and say, hey, you got a new review. Um, I'll go over a, a little bit more about reputation. Uh, do I? I can't remember. Um, well, I'll just say it now. Um, reviews are obviously critical. Uh, some of the stats on them are mind-numbing. Uh, just you can't believe uh, that these are the actual real um, ones. So, for example, uh, a five-star restaurant can charge 40% more for the exact same entree as a four-star restaurant. Same cut of beef, filet mignon, same side dishes, same portions. The perception that you're a five-star restaurant over a four-star restaurant is a 40% difference in your selling price. That's unbelievable. Another statistic that's crazy about reputation, 97% um, of consumers that read a review and then visit a business agree that that review is accurate. So if Yelp says that you're a three and a half star restaurant, 97% of the time when people read that, go and visit that restaurant and come out, they agree, yes, you're a three and a half star restaurant. So sometimes perception is reality and you have a lot more control over this if you own the profile, if you um, have claimed the profile. So again, everything so far, well, I guess web development can be expensive, but this is free. This is just taking the time um, to do that. And by the way, there's a lot of different sites if all you did was those top five, you'd be, uh, what's that? Sorry, I'm hearing an echo. Maybe I'm the one that talked to myself. Um, if you do those five, uh, you're ahead of the game, but there are a lot more. And there's uh, sites out there where you can go online, enter your uh, uh, business name, and it will tell you all the ones that are either claimed or unclaimed. You can search for that. Um, but at a minimum, just take care of those five. Oh, the other, the last reason those were important um, people always ask, what's the difference between, uh, or how do I get my business on mobile apps that I've never heard of that allow for local search? Or how do I get inside uh, point of interest systems on like cars? People, you know, you can go into a lot of cars nowadays into the navigation system and say, find me an Italian restaurant within three miles of here. Well, all of those systems, are, they do not have their own databases. They are almost all pulling from one of these five. You can maybe throw city search in there as a sixth one. If, you're, if you make sure that your business is listed in those and listed correctly, has correct information, enticing you know, descriptions, photos, et cetera, uh, all of a sudden you'll start ending up on apps you didn't even know you would be in. And that's a good thing because it adds to your discoverability. Okay. This one starts getting a little more technical, but um, the recommendation is simply build a guest database. Your goal is simply to get three things from as many people that walk into your restaurant as possible. Their name, their email address, and their phone number. And these are gonna be useful to you later on, uh, and I'll tell you why. But those are the three things. If you have other stuff, that's great. So if you have who they dine with, what their anniversary is, what their birthday is, who their kids are, all that stuff's fine. But for marketing purposes, you will get m the most bang for your buck by getting those three things. It's critical. Um, how do you get them? You can get them through reservations. If your restaurant takes reservations, you can get them through loyalty. You can simply ask. You can, uh, some point of sale systems have the ability to print out on receipts, like uh, go here and rate us. Any of those things are great, um, but you have to have a way to collect and build your own database, um, and you have to have it in a way that's usable um, for like mass marketing, digital marketing purposes. So uh, sometimes I'll have said this in the past, and people will go, I have a database. It's this pen and paper book that I wrote in. That's going to be kind of hard to use. It's better than nothing, um, but getting this into a, into a system, into a computer system that can be reused uh, is important.
participate in social media. That word is chosen very carefully. It is not do social media. It's not set up social media. It's participate in social media. Uh, and the reason for that is it is social media. It is people having conversations with each other. And a lot of people find businesses participating in this to be somewhat intrusive. So uh, restaurants aren't too guilty of this. But if you were to, to speak to them in corporate speak or press release style, that's not in the spirit of social media. Um, you need to get in there and have conversations. You need to um, don't think of this as a megaphone where you're just broadcasting at people. Yes, you can do that, but you also have to respond to them. Um, you're trying to build a conversation. You're trying to build a dialogue. Uh, at the end of the day, you're building a relationship with your customers. That's the online version of what uh, is the offline version of your hospitality experience. Um, the tone and the voice in social media should, should mirror the type of restaurant that you are. Uh, if you're a fast casual restaurant, you should have uh, an informal loose tone. If you're fine dining, seven course meals, prefix menus, that sort of thing, um, you maybe want it to be a little more um, sophisticated. Uh, but your brand needs to mirror uh, both online um, and offline. It's uh, pretty clear that the most important um, uh, network is Facebook. Uh, Twitter can be important. I think Instagram is rapidly gaining in importance uh, for, for restaurants. Um, but there's no doubt that Facebook is, is king, mainly for the two-way conversation um, and the ability to really have like a stored record. Uh, Twitter is very ephemeral, like someone tweets and like it almost didn't happen three days later, it's out of their news feed. Whereas, uh, Facebook kind of keeps a lasting record. So um, if you do, I'll, I'll pick a German one since I have heard Wisconsin's the most German state in the union. Um, you know, if you have Oktoberfest, it's great if people can go and look at images from three, four years ago from your past Oktoberfest. It shows how much fun they're having in their restaurant uh, and why they should come and participate. Twitter makes people work a lot harder to go back and see that, that old stuff. Um, same, yeah, Instagram is, is more recent as well. Uh, it's, it's a bias towards recency, um, but it's still uh, important. Probably no coincidence that Facebook owns that. Um, know what's going on locally. So if things are uh, happening, if there's an art and wine festival out in front of your restaurant, I, this is something that's fairly basic and many restaurants do very well. Um, but it's important for you to be a member and participate in the community um, and uh, uh, tying into local events and participating in the local dialogue. Even if you have nothing to say about your restaurant, like if uh, the local Little League team wins the regionals or something, just you know, congratulations from my restaurant is, uh, is a nice way to, to participate. Uh, and again, um, don't, uh, don't think that you're done with pictures on your website. You've uploaded them, they're there, they're done. You wanna use them in social media as much as possible too. Okay, we talked about this a little bit. Anyone see this sign? This is one of my favorite signs in the history of the internet. In case you can't read it, come in and try the worst meatball sandwich that one guy on Yelp ever had in his life. <laughs> would you go in and have that? I would totally go in and have that meatball sandwich, right? Like, I would totally go in there. Um, okay, so build your reputation. Um, there's, we have an entire 45 page ebook on, at Upserve uh, just on reputation. Um, but generally speaking, there's five things you need to know uh, about reviews, and I'm gonna list them pretty quickly here. So, the first thing is more reviews is better than less reviews. I think most people get that intuitively, um, and, but uh, the caution is actually don't over, don't give too much importance to this one thing. It's one of five factors. A lot of people think the number of reviews is the only factor, uh, either that or sentiment, like what their average is, but uh, uh, it is definitely important. Okay, so that's number one. Two, sentiment is important. Three stars is better than two stars. Four stars is better than three. Five is better than four. Obviously, you're um, trying to shoot as high as possible. Uh, so I think that's where most people stop with reputation, but there's three other things. Next one is recency. M more recent reviews are more important than older reviews. The reason why this is important to note is some people think like, okay, I need to work on my reputation. I got up to 100 reviews, I got up to four and a half stars, I'm done. No. If you don't do anything or if, if uh, 
you know, all of a sudden your review rate goes down and you look a year later and you've only had six reviews in the last year, that probably wouldn't happen because people review on their own. Um, you're going to slide down search results. Uh, you're not going to show up as high on some of these sites. And the reason is, is because these sites use it as one, you know, service changes. Maybe the owners changed, you know, a good waiter left, a bad waiter came, vice versa. So uh, the experience people are having most recently is the most relevant. And the second is it's a proxy for whether the business is still open. Businesses do go out of business sometimes. And if someone came in and reviewed you three days ago, it's pretty clear you're still open. Whereas if you hadn't had a review in about a year, um, that can be a problem. The next issue is, or the next factor, is velocity. Um, and this is how many uh, reviews you get over what period of time. It's, criti it's critically important to have your reviews spread out or to come in in a natural fashion. It's way better to get one review a day rather than seven reviews on Monday and none the rest of the week. And you're like, hmm, that's interesting, why is that? All of these sites have spam filters, just like Google has spam filters, just like your email has a spam filter, and they're looking for anything that looks spammy. And when people try and fake their online reputation, they don't, they don't call their dad on Monday, their mom on Tuesday, their sister-in-law on Wednesday. They call everyone at the same time and say, I have a problem, please go and review me. And so they see this huge review spike, and then they're done, and then it goes back down. That spike looks very fishy, it looks artificial to them. Um, so that's the spammy version. But there's a legitimate thing that happens that people do. It's like, oh, I need to work on my reputation, so I'm going to send an email out to my entire list. Well, guess what happens? It looks exactly the same. Um, so if you want to be successful uh, in reaching out to have people review you, which I very much encourage you to do, you need to stagger them, uh, which you know, with a lot of email programs you can do, send 10 emails out a day over the course of a month rather than 500 out on a single day. Um, and then the final aspect on reputation that's important is, um, is what they actually write about you, the keywords in there. So it's great if people write, nice restaurant, had a good time. It's much better if they write, I tried the trace carnes, it was spectacular, you have to try the bread pudding. Um, so generally speaking, you want a perfect review, it would be longer rather than shorter, it would uh, mention specific menu items, it would mention specific aspects of your business uh, that would appeal to the next person that's coming in. My final note on reputation is what do you do when you get a bad review? And uh, this is very simple advice, and it's respond to it um, in a public fashion with one twist. Your goal when you respond to someone that writes you a bad review is not the person that wrote you the bad review. It's everyone else that's watching the dialogue between the two of you. So you are not going to probably convince that person that wrote you a bad review to change it or delete it. But what you need to say is, I'm sorry you had a bad experience. I'd love an opportunity to make it up to you. Please come in. And they might never come in, but the 5,000 people that read that exchange after the fact will be impressed with how you handled it. So just remember who your audience is uh, when you have a bad review and how you deal with it. So do not get in an argument. Do not get combative. Do not huff and puff and say that your soup wasn't cold. Um, just you know, acknowledge that they had a bad experience, even if you don't uh, acknowledge um, the specifics of what they claim. And remember that your audience is everyone else that reads it. Okay, now you have a database. Um, if you followed step three, now you're going to email it. Um, this is really important. You remember one of the marketing goals is to stay top of mind. Uh, email is a great way to do that. Yeah, uh, getting into their social media feeds is, is awesome. Um, but by far, the number one way that you're going to be able to do this is through email. It's essentially free, although you might have to pay for an email service provider. Um, but it's incredibly effective. Uh, if you look at any survey of effective marketing techniques from Fortune 500 B2B techniques all the way down to local marketing, uh, email shows up amongst the top two or three, if not number one, in every single survey. Um, it can be hard. I would suggest that uh, you sign, uh, assign someone to it um, and that you, uh, you have to send something at least once a month. Uh, otherwise, uh, most of the email uh, providers today, like Gmail, Yahoo, etc., um, they're doing some sort of priority on the inbox. 
Uh, and so if you're someone that only emails once or twice a year, that looks like someone, it looks like an email that the recipient isn't interacting with very often, and so you get deprioritized. Now you might get put, in the case of Gmail, in the non-priority part of the inbox, or you might get put in the spam folder, um, but this is within your control. So once you start emailing, you want to email at least once a month. You can do way more than that. Um, there are businesses that email people twice a day. Um, my wife signs up for this shoe list or something. I have no idea what it is, but oh my God, do they send her. And she cannot get enough of this stuff, and that's her. She likes that. If people like your restaurant, if they're foodies, um, uh, they are receptive uh, to this. And I'm not telling you to go home and start mailing everyone in your list twice a day, but um, uh, so this can be tested. You should figure out what everyone wants. If you have a sophisticated email provider, maybe you can figure out who wants to get uh, notified once a month with like a summary of everything that you sent. Some people maybe want once a week. Some people maybe want to hear your daily specials every day, but that's up to you to figure out uh, the cadence for which they want to be communicated with. Um, but the, the cardinal sin here is to let your list die on the vine and not email at least once a month. Um, I gave you some ideas here. You know, do you have new dishes? Are you having events? Spotlight your staff if someone came in for a 60th anniversary or something like that, you know, as long as they don't mind you using their pictures or calling out their names. Um, this doesn't have to be a huge ask. I'm not telling you to write a newsletter where you, know, you feel like by the end of the year you've written a novel. You just need to have that email appear in their inbox, have them see their, uh, the name of the restaurant and remind them, oh yeah, I like this place, I should go there again. Hold events. Um, I think a lot of people do this anyway. Uh, what I want to do is put a slightly different twist on it, and that is I want you to figure out what your restaurant is uniquely good at and that's different in the marketplace. So the easy one right off the bat that's neither unique uh, nor novel is a wine tasting. Lots of people um, do wine tastings. I still recommend it. A lot of people love it. Um, if you can get like a local vineyard or purveyor to come in and, and uh, um, support you, which by the way is usually pretty easy to do, they're always willing to promote their products, um, uh, then do that. But one of the most successful things one of our customers has done, uh, they looked at their upserve data and they uh, figured out they were selling a lot of single malt scotch. So they had a single malt scotch tasting. How many people do that? That's not very common. So if there's something, um, you know, you're going to have an ethnic food night or uh, there's particular beverages that you're uh, famous for or you're starting to do trivia on Thursday nights, something, uh, it's a great way to boost business um, on... Uh, uh, on slower nights, uh, the bourbon or the single malt scotch was it? Bur single? I'm sorry, it was single barrel bourbon. Those are different. I don't drink either, so that would probably I'd be, I'd be the beer tasting guy. Um, the single barrel bourbons, um, they held it on like a Tuesday night, and uh, they increased sales like 300 percent for the night. I mean, it's unbelievable, and it's it's because they tried something different and and played to their strengths. Um, the reason they noticed their data was so high and people were buying it is they actually. Uh, already carried a lot of single bourbon, single barrel bourbons. Um, and so it was unique to them. It played on their strengths rather than trying to like force fit uh, events that you hear in a magazine into your own restaurant. So figure out something that's unique uh, and then piggyback on the community. Um, I used to work at a TGI Fridays oh so many years ago. Uh, and there was a local chili cook off and so participating in that uh, somehow sending a booth out there, but also doing something in the restaurant at the same time and sending people back and forth, uh, you know, is, uh, is big. That, that one's pretty basic. I bet you guys are pretty much doing that. All right, this is my most unique and secret tip of the day. Virtually no restaurants are doing this and I just can't understand why. Well, the first one is you need a good database to do it. So I told you Facebook is the most important social network. And that's true. They offer, and a lot of other sites offer, uh, a service called retargeting. Retargeting are the ads that follow you all over the internet. Have you ever like gone to a really obscure like sock site and then you're on Yahoo and there's an advertisement for those exact socks? You're like, wow, that's really interesting. How'd they know I wanted these? Well, that's retargeting. Um, Facebook allows you to do this, but what they allow you, uh, allow you to do is to create a targeted audience where you can send them a list of email addresses and or phone numbers. They will match them to the people in their database 
and then you can put ads in front of them. So this means that you are putting ads in front of your existing customers. You're not spending money trying to drive new people. You're putting uh, your ads directly in front of people that have already been into your restaurant. The return on investment on this is incredible. Um, you can set up a budget of like 50 to $75. And if you're the type of person that goes around your restaurant and talks to your customers and just ask them like, hey, why'd you come in at night? You'd be surprised how many start mentioning this for a very low spend. Um, it's where you can start combining um, these different things. You had a database, you, are, you have a Facebook profile, now you're throwing advertising in, uh, in there. It leverages everything together uh, and it's incredibly powerful. So uh, I encourage everyone to look into that. All right, two things to avoid. So I had uh, the 10 practical tips or 10, basi 10 basics. I wrote this, I should know it. Um, that eight of them were positive. These are things you do. The last two are things to be wary of or things to avoid. Uh, I'm not going to mention particular names. I'm sure everyone's thinking of a daily deal site in their head right now. Maybe you've tried this before. The math on these is terrible. Um, I just want to caution everyone uh, about that. And it seems really easy that you get to spend a little money. They have a big audience. They're going to drive people into your restaurant. Uh, and you can even see um, you can see the surge in traffic, like you can, because people have to bring the coupons in to, to redeem them. The math is awful though. Uh, roughly speaking, you would have to turn 20% of the people that redeem the coupons into re repeat guests that come in at least three or four times to get what anyone would consider to be a positive ROI. Um, I don't want to say it can't be done, and I, I don't want to say it hasn't been done, but broadly speaking, over all of their customers, um, they're making money on the back of your business. Uh, and it's, again, not telling you not to do it. But I, by the way, when the slide was written, this, uh, when I had it up this morning, it said avoid daily deals. And I kind of backed off the rhetoric a little bit and changed it to understand. But make sure you absolutely understand what you're getting into um, before you sign up. And the, um, the main thing is, uh, you actually lose money on that first encounter because they're giving 50% off and then they take another 50% of the 50% in a fee. So you only get 25% usually uh, of what they sell the, uh, or like the original dishes for, which as you probably know is below your food cost, below your drink cost, below or beverage cost. Um, you have to have an incredibly good solid plan for turning them into repeat business for that to make sense. And the final one, avoid ridiculous advertising. Um, in the advertising industry, uh, most display ads uh, are sold on what's called a CPM basis, and that stands for cost per thousand. That means every time a thousand of your ads are displayed, you pay that fee. Um, this is how television advertising is sold. This is how radio advertising is sold. Uh, and a lot of um, local advertising is sold this way as well. Um, the more targeted the audience, the higher the price is in terms of CPM. But I can, as a digital marketer in charge of marketing for Upserve, go to a display advertising site and pay $10, $20 CPMs um, for broad traffic. And let's say I want to target restaurateurs, I might start paying uh, $50, $60. Um, some of the advertising programs that target restaurateurs start at $500, $600 CPMs. It's ridiculous. Um, so if you do talk to someone about external advertising, and it is display or radio advertising, etc., understand your costs. I guarantee if you do a little bit of legwork, you can find an ad broker, you can find a different network, you can find something else, anything else um, to spend your money on rather than a $500 CPM. Um, and again, I'm, I don't really want to call anyone out, but I will just say some of the sites that you're not really enjoying their reviews on, but then call you to sell you advertising on, pick a site, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll let you imagine one, are the worst defenders of this. Um, so just be wary of uh, 
of the amount that they're charging you. And because what they'll do to hide it is instead of telling you what the CPM cost is, they'll say, oh, your cost is $500 for one month on our radio network, or your, your cost is $400 to display your ad. So they'll t they're telling you the total cost, but they're not telling you what the rate cost is. And that's the secret to understanding whether you're getting ripped off or not. And that's it.